Seven knights gleaming in white garb stood idle, flanking the Iron Throne. These were the King's Guard, warriors and heroes of great renown, tasked with protecting the King of Westeros and his royal family with their very lives. Election to the King's Guard was considered the utmost honor for a knight, though it meant renouncing title, lands, and family for life. Instead, what awaited was pure and true service to the realm, and the men of the King's Guard approached their duty with vigor and virtue. However, like all institutions, the King's Guard inevitably suffered from corruption, especially as Robert's Rebellion drew to a close and the age presented in A Song of Ice and Fire took hold. The men in the King's Guard became pawns to those who played the Game of Thrones, putting their own desires or the desires of those whom they served above the good of the realm. Or worse, they displayed dreadful qualities, reflecting the worst of man rather than the best. No longer was the White Cloak an honor of a lifetime and an opportunity to display chivalry and valor, but a position with which to forward agendas, hang vicious threats, and garner no respect. Hello everyone, and welcome back to Exploring Fiction. In A Song of Ice and Fire, the Kingsguard was often spoken of in admirable tones, but the actions and reality of its members were not so admirable. Gone were the days of Sir Gerald Hightower, or the Sword of the Morning, now replaced by the Kingslayer, Sir Osmond Kettleblack, and the silent giant Sir Robert Strong. Even Barristan the Bold was dismissed from his duty, marking the end of truly good men in the Kingsguard. So, what really is the Kingsguard, and who did it consist of in both past and present? How did such an illustrious order fall so far from its reputed chivalry? Let's explore. The inception of the Kingsguard occurred during the reign of Aegon the Conqueror, the first Targaryen to rule in Westeros. After a failed attempt on Aegon's life, his wife Visenya suggested the creation of the order. There were to be seven knights for seven kingdoms, who were to swear oaths similar to those of the Night's Watch, rescinding rights to all claims, turning their lives into those of service solely to the king. Some tumultuous events took place involving the Kingsguard, namely the power struggle between Prince Jaehaerys Targaryen and Maegor the Cruel, and the Dance of the Dragons, but the chivalry and righteousness of the knights were hardly brought into question. And from every era of the Kingsguard emerged heroes who became legends, such as Sir Duncan the Tall, a hedge knight hailing from Flea Bottom who ascended to Lord Commander of the White Cloaks. Preceding the events of A Song of Ice and Fire was Robert's Rebellion, which saw the Targaryen dynasty overthrown and a reallocation of power throughout the Seven Kingdoms. But during the rebellion, many great men fought and died as members of the Mad King's White Cloaks. Although they were on the losing side, the deeds and sacrifices of these Kingsguard men etched them into the mythology of Westeros itself. Sir Jonathor Derry and Prince Lewin Martell fell at the Battle of the Trident, leaving the world not long before their charge, Prince Rhaegar Targaryen. But soon after the heart of the war was captured at the Trident, the soul of the war was won at the foot of the Tower of Joy. As recounted in a dream by Eddard Stark in A Game of Thrones, he, along with six of his most trusted northern men, rode south to Dorne to save his captured sister Lyanna. Three members of the Kingsguard stood in his way, Sir Oswell Went, Sir Arthur Dane, the Sword of the Morning, and Lord Commander of the Kingsguard, Sir Gerald Hightower, the White Bull. When the dust settled and blood gave the Red Mountains of Dorne their name, only Lord Eddard Stark and Howland Reed still lived of the Northerners, and all three men of the Kingsguard were dead. Lord Eddard even once recalled that if not for Reed, he would have fallen to Sir Arthur Dane's legendary sword. Yet, when Stark reflected on the grisly conflict, he did so in sadness, but also in admiration at the men he was forced to kill. Sir Gerald Hightower, Sir Arthur Dane, and Sir Oswell Went were legendary, but Lord Eddard seemed to lament having to kill them. In better circumstances, they could have been allies instead of enemies. And while in the narrative of A Song of Ice and Fire very few truly good men exist, Lord Eddard Stark was one of them. So, if the Lord of Winterfell idolized the men of the Mad King's Kingsguard, then surely they epitomize virtue and chivalry. However, not all remain loyal in their task. Sir Jamie Lannister, the youngest member of the Kingsguard during Robert's Rebellion, 
solidified the usurper's victory by breaking his oaths and killing King Aerys II. Though the reason and merit of this action is a story for another time, the death of the Mad King cemented the Targaryen downfall. Though it led to the end of the war and allowed Robert Baratheon to take the Iron Throne, killing the Mad King began the distrust and disdain for the Kingsguard in Westeros, at least in the time A Song of Ice and Fire took place. Sir Jaime was allowed to retain his position on the Kingsguard under Baratheon rule, but he was forever known as the contemptible, oath-breaking Kingslayer. Less than two decades after his grand victory, King Robert Baratheon met his demise at the tusks of a boar while on the hunt, though keen individuals may have noticed his wife's hand in his death. Regardless, young Joffrey was placed on the Iron Throne, and one of his first actions as king was quite unprecedented. He dismissed Lord Commander of the Kingsguard Barristan Selmy from his duties, intentionally circumventing the Kingsguard's oath to serve for life. Barristan the Bold was the final holdover from the Mad King's White Cloaks, and the finest knight in the world. Rightly taking offense to his ousting, he disappeared from King's Landing and the minds of the collective population. With the departure of Sir Barristan, the last good man of the Kingsguard was gone, and the White Cloaks were now filled only with pawns and degenerates. Joffrey and Tommen's Kingsguards were pitiful compared to those of their forebears. Of Sir Jaime Lannister, much has already been spoken, but aside from his tarnished name as the Kingslayer, he also garnered the reputation of an incestuous man. Through the propaganda of spread by Stannis Baratheon, many viewed Sir Jaime in an even worse light, believing wholeheartedly in the wretched yet true accusations that he laid with his own sister. Meanwhile, replacing the dismissed Sir Barristan was Sandor Clegane, King Joffrey's own sworn shield. The Hound, as he was known, held his own vile reputation among highborns and lowborns alike. He carried out Joffrey's dirty work like the obedient dog he was, signaling to all that he was deeply in the pocket of the Lannister family. And it was no better that he was the brother of Sir Gregor Clegane, the vilest man in the Seven Kingdoms. Sandor served on the Kingsguard until the Battle of the Blackwater, during which he deserted his position as White Cloak and personal protector to Joffrey. The next member of the Kingsguard under the Lannister Baratheon boys was Sir Mirren Trant. Sir Mirren was thought of as cruel and conniving by his brother-in-arms Sir Jaime, and as Cersei's puppet by Lord Varys. Those two figures could hardly be considered good, so if they believed Sir Mirren to be a vile man, well... Nevertheless, how did Sir Mirren Trant behave in the narrative of A Song of Ice and Fire? Two instances revealed his true character. Firstly, King Joffrey used Sir Mirren to beat Sansa Stark into obedience, an act he carried out despite its moral misgivings. Secondly, when Sir Barristan was dismissed from the Kingsguard before the entirety of Joffrey's court, Sir Mirren laughed at the embarrassment and shame Barristan the Bold suffered. So, while Mirren Trant may have possessed the physical competence and prowess to occupy a Kingsguard position, he surely failed in the Department of Morality. Another holdover from the Usurper's Kingsguard was his newest appointee, Sir Eris Oakhart. Sir Eris was noted to be the finest man in Joffrey's Kingsguard by Sansa Stark, as she preferred his company over any of the other White Cloaks. Still, the quality of his competition lent little merit to this claim. Oakhart joined in with his peers to scoff at the shame of Sir Barristan during his dismissal, and he was amongst those who beat the Stark girl on the whim of the king, though he hit her softer than the others. Sir Eris considered it a relief when Tyrion sent him to Dorne to protect Princess Myrcella, but even far in the south, he strayed from his virtuous purpose. Before long, Sir Eris bowed to the seduction of Princess Arianne Martell, who even convinced him to aid in her plot of installing Myrcella on the vacant throne as opposed to young Tommen. The scheme went awry, and Eris died in an impulsive rampage against Ario Hota and a troop of Dornish guards. Arianne mourned the tragedy, and Marcella sustained injuries, but Sir Eris was dead nonetheless. Even in his final actions, he displayed his lack of honor and betrayal of his own word. He slept with a woman when he swore to take no wife, and committed treason by backing one other than the rightful heir, going against all that the white cloak upon his back stood for. Though the target of less focus than many other men of the Kingsguard, Sir Preston Greenfield too held his vices. Greenfield was yet another white cloak openly amused at Sir Barristan's public removal from the position of Lord Commander, laughing in blatant mockery of the old man. 
What's more, Sir Preston broke his vows numerous times, meeting and laying with a draper's wife when her husband was gone from home. However, Greenfield had limited time left in the world. For during the riot on the streets of King's Landing, directly after Marcella's departure to Dorne, Sir Preston was torn from his horse by the common people and brutally murdered. He was stabbed and trampled upon so heavily his corpse was on the verge of being unidentifiable. Replacing the massacred Sir Preston was Sir Balin Swan, second son of the Lord of Stonehelm. Out of all the White Cloaks to serve under Joffrey and Tommen, Sir Balin sits as the exception amongst his scornful peers. Before he was elected to the Kingsguard, Sir Balin was suggested to Lord Eddard Stark by Littlefinger as an ally against Queen Cersei. While the Lord of Winterfell enlisted the Gold Cloaks instead, the very recommendation of Balin gave his reputation some weight. Many who interacted with the man, including most of the Lannisters, believed him fit in build and character to serve in the Kingsguard. Even when under pressure, Sir Balin remained true. At Lord Tyrion's trial, he confessed that he didn't believe Tyrion murdered King Joffrey, though he had to believe his eyes and ears. While Sir Balin served the crown dutifully, he surely was a lone light in the dark cesspool that was the modern Kingsguard. However, he was notably hand-picked by Cersei Lannister herself, casting a shadow of doubt over his otherwise clean record. Speaking of Cersei's pawns, the next noteworthy member of the Kingsguard was Sir Mandon Moore. Hailing from the Vale, Sir Mandon was a dour, gaunt fellow whose company was appreciated by next to none. Uneasiness followed wherever Moore went, and this presence lent well to his personality. Sir Mandon obeyed Joffrey without question when ordered to beat innocent Sansa Stark, who already found him disturbing. But during the Battle of the Blackwater, Moore committed his most telling deed. Following Tyrion and his charge at the riverfront, Sir Mandon fought bravely at first. When they clambered aboard the ships, though, Tyrion almost fell to his death. Sir Mandon offered him a helping hand, but rescinded it and promptly slashed off the nose of the king's hand. Tyrion made his way back to the deck, but Moore held his blade to the dwarf's throat. Only by his loyal squire Podrick Payne was Tyrion saved, and Sir Mandon careened overboard, drowning under the weight of his armor. Later, Tyrion pried into the matter and discovered Sir Mandon had attempted to assassinate him under the orders of his own sweet sister, Cersei Lannister. Instead of acting for the good of the realm, Sir Mandon Moore died being manipulated in the Game of Thrones. A rather pitiful holdover from King Robert's Kingsguard was Sir Boris Blount. A portly, fiery knight, Sir Boris was a good fighter, but lacked most other qualifications to make a good man of the Kingsguard. Infamous for his cowardice and his weight, Blount was an oathbreaker as well, frequenting the Street of Silk to lie with prostitutes. Both Lord Varys and Tyrion Lannister believed the man to be yet another of Cersei's stooges, but even the Queen Regent grew tired of him. After laughing at Sir Barristan's shameful dismissal and beating Sansa so harshly that she named him the worst of Joffrey's Kingsguard, Sir Boris lost his position when he surrendered young Prince Tommen on the road to Rosby without a fight. Cersei, enraged at his resurfacing cowardice, stripped him of his position and threw him into the dungeons beneath King's Landing to rot, replacing him with one of her braver pawns. His time in prison was short-lived, however, as the new Hand of the King, Lord Tywin Lannister, reinstated him after the Hound's desertion. Soon after, Lord Commander Jaime Lannister named him the official food taster to the king, a humiliating yet fitting task for the pudgy man. Sir Boris failed in his duties as a noble Kingsguard again when he, along with Sir Osmond Kettleblack, thoughtlessly killed the two turnkeys stationed in the dungeons the night of Tyrion's escape. Yet later in the narrative, unbeknownst to Sir Boris, his reputation was even further spat upon when Cersei and Sir Osmond concluded that he was the worst fighter in the Kingsguard, and so would make for the most incompetent champion for Queen Marjorie. Though Cersei's plans crumbled to dust, Sir Boris continued with the Kingsguard, growing noticeably fatter and slower. Even setting aside all his innumerable vile deeds and shortcomings, Sir Boris hardly possessed the physical attributes necessary to serve on the Kingsguard effectively. Amongst a plethora of shady individuals, Sir Osmond Kettleblack may have held the title of most suspicious member of the Kingsguard. The most prominent of three brothers, 
Sir Osmond was a muscled, amiable man, though completely illiterate. Along with Osney and Osfrid, Sir Osmond rose to prominence as a sellsword to Cersei, though he secretly was under the payroll of Bronn and Tyrion by extension. The Queen Regent grew fond of the Kettle Blacks, however, and believed they had her best interests in mind. When Sir Boris Blount was removed from his position for cowardice, Cersei replaced him with Sir Osmond. As noted by Tyrion, there were an infinite amount of better choices for the job, but fewer men were as close of allies to King Joffrey and his mother. This was only proven further in the Battle of the Blackwater, when Sir Osmond and his brothers chose to obey the orders of Cersei over those of Tyrion, despite the Lannister siblings' war for their allegiance. Ultimately, it appeared as though Cersei achieved victory, as Sir Osmond went on to do her bidding for some time. This included falsifying a testimony at Tyrion's very trial, though the whole point was rendered moot. Littlefinger, Lord Peter Baelish, however, proved he was still two steps ahead of all the other schemers in King's Landing, for he revealed to Sansa Stark that the Kettle Blacks had been in his employ all along, though Sir Osmond was beginning to take too much to Cersei. After the murder of Lord Tywin Lannister, Sir Osmond, along with Osney and Osfrid, colluded with Cersei yet again to aid her in slandering the good Queen Marjorie, and though the plot failed miserably, the whole affair brought to light once again their conniving nature. So, though Sir Osmond Kettleblack was more adored than some of his peers, he hardly lived up to the traditional standard of the Kingsguard. He was elevated to the position because of his status as a sellsword, and whether he served as an underling to Cersei, Tyrion, or Littlefinger mattered not. He lacked principle, using his white cloak as a means to an end in the Game of Thrones, rather than an honor to respect and cherish. The most recent inductee into the Kingsguard in the narrative of A Song of Ice and Fire was the silent giant Sir Robert Strong. The eight-foot knight was a twisted creation of Clyburn and champion to the disgraced Cersei. As Cersei's plots crumbled to dust, she ordered Clyburn to fill the empty spot in the Kingsguard, easily convincing her son, King Tommen, to go along with it. For after all, he was just a boy. He had to listen to his mother. And so it was that at the former Queen Regent's Walk of Atonement, Sir Robert scooped her up and carried her to the gatehouse, all while wearing shining white armor that would crush any normal mortal. Quyburn declared strong as Cersei's champion, also claiming the giant had taken a vow of silence until his liege lady was proven innocent and the realm was at peace. Lumbering back to the White Sword Tower, Sir Robert fell in with the other White Cloaks. His colleagues, however, quickly became leery of the man. They noted that, at least to their knowledge, he required no food, drink, or time to relieve himself. Soon, general suspicion about Sir Robert's identity spread, and while not blatantly stated as fact, many believed him to be some mutilated animation of Sir Gregor Clegane. The mountain's skull had been sent to Dorne, and Sir Robert never removed his helm. But even if the skull in Sunspear was a fake, Sir Gregor was surely dead by poison from Prince Oberyn's spear that turned his very blood black. And so, Sir Robert Strong must have been an undead, magic-ridden creation of the dishonored maester. Though so little of Sir Robert Strong's part to play was just beginning to unfold, the reason for his appointment to the Kingsguard was obvious. It was purely utilitarian, a desperate attempt by Cersei Lannister to save herself from shame and death. The final member of the Kingsguard under Kings Joffrey and Tommen Baratheon was quite unlike the rest. He was the renowned Knight of Flowers, Sir Loras Tyrell. The third son of Highgarden was a truly good man, already a legend at his young age. He was exactly the type of knight that belonged on the Kingsguard. Handsome, beloved, and deadly with a blade, Sir Loras garnered an impressive reputation during the reign of King Robert Baratheon, and it never waned. He served under Renly until the man's death, and then bent the knee to the Lannisters along with the rest of Highgarden. In an idea Littlefinger claimed to plant, Sir Loras pledged to the Kingsguard after the death of Sir Mandon Moore. Though his father disagreed, Sir Loras did so to protect his sister Marjorie, the future queen, in a court full of hidden threats. Though not keen on Joffrey, Loras came to care for King Tommen as well as Marjorie, holding to his vows to protect the young Baratheon. 
Sir Loras demonstrated maturity and virtue in his time at Tommen's side, and even gained favor with the young king. But Cersei, who still grasped much of the power in King's Landing after Lord Tywin's death, despised how her son idolized the Knight of the Reach. So when opportunity sprang to ship Sir Loras far away, Cersei didn't hesitate. She chose him to lead the Siege of Dragonstone, simultaneously directing his influence away from Tommen and freeing herself to torment Queen Marjorie. At Dragonstone, Sir Loras was victorious, but suffered grave injuries. His life teetered on the brink, a question yet to be answered. Sir Loras Tyrell was one of the greatest candidates for the Kingsguard in all of Westeros, but his goodness and adherence to chivalry only led him to misery and bloodshed. Donning a white cloak in the Seven Kingdoms once meant something. The finest knights in the land strived for the opportunity, for it meant they could demonstrate their sense of justice for the rest of their lives. As members of the Kingsguard, knights from across Westeros could practice virtue, putting aside selfishness and serving the king in ideals higher than themselves. The Kingsguard of Aerys Targaryen II was the last bastion of nobility, though. For when Sir Jaime Lannister became the Kingslayer and Sir Barristan Selmy was relieved of his duties, the Kingsguard became instead a political position. Aside from Sir Loras, who gained nothing but pain from taking the White Cloak, the rest of the Kingsguard under both Joffrey and Tommen Baratheon was full of despicable men. They were fat, weak, corrupt, manipulated, and wicked. Some were oathbreakers, some were political pawns, but none measured up to the heroes of the past. The Kingsguard, as it was seen in A Song of Ice and Fire, was an institution corrupt to the core, devoid of the chivalry for which it was once renowned. And so I think it's fitting to end on this quote from Bran Stark in A Clash of Kings. Something his father had told him once when he was little came back to him suddenly. He had asked Lord Eddard if the Kingsguard were truly the finest knights in the Seven Kingdoms. No longer, he answered, but once they were a marvel. A shining lesson to the world. So, that's all for this video. Leave a comment below with your thoughts. I'd love to hear them. Leave a like if you enjoyed, and subscribe if you're new here. And don't forget to check out my website, russellawellsauthor.com, for exclusive fiction and more. And sign up for my mailing list to get access to free exclusive content. The links for all of those things are below in my description, so I hope you check them out. And like always, I will see you next time.